Hello, and welcome everyone to the first event of the 2020 Virtual Composers Conference. Thank you for joining us. I am delighted you are all here. My name is- Hello, Brody. and welcome everyone to the first event of the 2020 Virtual- And I am Virtual the Artistic Director of the Composers Conference. It is an honor to have the Symposium on Anti-Racism in New Music be the opening event for our conference this year. Today's event is a conversation among these four exceptional artists regarding their meaningful work in the field, allowing them to discuss their practices, interests, and visions. This symposium will not center on whiteness. A word about anti-racism. Anti-racism is about identifying racism and acting to end it. This means more than well-meaningness or good intentions, and it does not involve absolutions. It's about doing and doing it again and again and again. It's my job as a white person to allow myself to be vulnerable, to call humility to my aid, to excavate my truth, how racism has been a part of the world I live in, acknowledge it, and to actively be part of change and healing. I want to have the imagination to be part of a world where equality means, really means, equality and respect for everyone, where power is shared with everyone without bias, where the center of our culture, the center of our society has many parts and many understandings. So, when you observe racism in an institution, act. When you experience racism in a system, act. When you see racism in someone's behavior, act. If we all do this, do this together, it'll be a lot easier than you think. Let's begin. Our symposium will be divided into three parts. Upon completing my introductory remarks, the following 25 minutes will be comprised of prepared statements made by each artist. Following will be a conversation by our artists on topics related to their work lasting approximately 45 minutes. We will close the symposium with a Q&A for the final 15 to 20 minutes. If you would like to submit a question, please place it in the chat scroll to the right of this YouTube broadcast. We will be collecting questions from that scroll and I will ask them in the final section of this event. If you would be so kind to word your question clearly and succinctly, that would be really helpful. It may not be possible to get through all the questions, but I will do my best to get through as many as I can. I am honored to introduce our four guests. Sarah Cargill, she, her, they, them, is a performing artist, cultural worker, writer, and freelance curator whose work articulates and is the alchemical consequence of black interiority, somatic memory, and queer intimacies. Exploring these relationships through the spectrum of sound and silence is central to their practice. Sarah is a recipient of the San Francisco Arts Commission's Individual Artist Grant for the 2020-2021 grant cycle and was the inaugural fellow, fellow of SOMA Arts Cultural Center's Curatorial Residency Program in 2018. She currently resides on unceded Ramatush Ohlone land, Yilamu, in her hometown of San Francisco. Anthony Green, he, him, his is a composer, a performer, and social justice artist whose various creative and pedagogical projects have been, have been presented in over 25 countries in venues such as Jordan Hall, Boston, Tivoli, Vrendenburg, Utrecht, Spike Gallery, Berlin, the Israel Conservatory in Tel Aviv, the Shoe Factory in Cyprus, Symphony Space, Spectrum, and Marian Anderson Hall in New York, among others. 
a former McKnight visiting composer, Green, has been invited to numerous residencies in the United States and Europe. He is also the co-founder and associate director of Boston-based Castle of Our Skins, dedicated to celebrating Black artistry through music. Amadeus Regusera, he him his, makes work that engages with the embodied and acoustical energy of sound and the erotics of its production. In addition to concert music, his practice intersects with visual and performance art. Recent projects include new pieces for the Living Earth Show, the Echo Ensemble, the University of California Berkeley Symphony, and the Left Coast Chamber Ensemble. He was recently commissioned by Splinter Reed's Woodwind Quintet to compose a new multimedia work for the fall 2020. Shalini Vision, she, her, hers, is a Los Angeles-based violinist who is a member of the Lyris Quartet and Bright Work New Music. She is a frequent collaborator of Wadada Leo Smith, Billy Childs, and Chinnery Home. Now we will begin with opening statements from each of our guests, beginning with Shalini. Thank you, Kurt. The powerful movement that has risen up following the murder of George Floyd and the protests that have resulted around the world in support of Black Lives Matter have brought about a reckoning in all disciplines and fields and forced the world to take a closer look at the inherent racism in the structures that we have all worked under. Personally, I have been reflecting on how to make change in the classical music industry and for our purposes today, specifically within the new music community, which I feel has really been my home for most of my career. Much of the focus of my thinking in this area has been centered around two ideas. The role of the performer in early life, experiences as a student, receiving training, and also the space that they occupy as their career progresses into the professional world and the work to be done in that space. As a performer, I'm often asked to provide a voice for the art of another, but how am I taught to produce that voice, which is the embodiment of another's creation? What does that training look like? So much of our instrumental training as children and in colleges and conservatories is centered on a Eurocentric tradition and is focused on conforming to long-standing rules and standards which have been set forth generations ago by people who don't represent my journey or my history or that of others like me. That tradition is also defined and enforced by institutions that don't honor the different ways in which creativity can take shape for performers. The different ways we could express ourselves, the alternate sound worlds that we can occupy. I truly believe that what draws many of us to the creation and performance of new music is the opportunity to work outside these confines of that history that the classical music world puts onto us and to potentially find a space clear of that Eurocentric tradition to create our work and find our voices. And within that space to search for a more honest voice and a sound world that more accurately represents our personal histories and journeys. That voice is sometimes more raw, sometimes more filled with emotion and presence than that which we have been trained to produce. It won't sound like the voice that was the product of the schooling and my training. Striving to create that honest voice in my performances has been a major part of my work in new music. A significant component to finding that voice for me personally has been my partnership with composers from varying backgrounds, many of whom are well-versed in idioms other than just Western classical music. In particular, the genre-defying music of Wadada Leo Smith, who I consider a mentor, has taught me so much about the broadening of musical language and particularly the power of improvisation and the importance of that skill to the voice of an artist. Being able to improvise without constructs or limitations has been the opening of a door, door to a new realm of sound and creativity and a truly empowering force in my playing and in the development of my singular voice. In the professional world, if we are lucky enough to find that voice, what comes next? 
As performers, we are so often trained to be passive observers in the process of creating performances and programming and are not invited to participate in that process in ways that would make our own creativity shine and make our voices heard. Programs are created by music directors and pieces are assigned to players with no real conversation taking place between the two. Entire seasons are shaped by the tastes of a board of directors without our input and we as performers are resigned to a passive role. As a result, the world of new music has created its own Eurocentric tradition and has lionized a small group of composers whose works are performed over and over and over. In order for this to change, performers with different stories to tell and different histories have to be brought to the table where those decisions are being made so that this process can become more collaborative and more representative of who we are. If we are given the opportunity to give input and be a part of the dialogue that goes into creating programming and creating performances, then possibly we can move, move towards a more equitable and inclusive view of the new music world. Hi, I'm Amadeus Regisera. Um, thank you, Kurt, for the introduction and thank you for having me. And um, so I'll begin my statement. Uh, in moments of crisis, I try to remember why I became a composer. As a student, before I knew any composers, before I learned how to compose, there was new music, the sound of it, how it looked, and the energy of it. It was strange, ugly, provocative, alluring, and beautifully ambiguous. On the face of it, new music had and still has the potential to deliver any and all possibilities. However, as time passed, I realized and learned many things about the kinds of people who wrote the music, their pedigrees and philosophies, about the spaces where this music was performed, about the audiences who attended these concerts. That what I was taught and shown about new music left out so many perspectives and voices, most often those voices whose experiences were closer to mine. But despite this rude awakening to new music, I never forgot my hopeful if naive reaction to hearing all of this for the first time, the palpable feeling that anything was possible. Perhaps this is why I still call myself a composer, why I still write music, and why I'm here at the Composers Conference many years after I was a student in, the, in 2011. Despite what I had learned, I still believe that new music can be a vehicle for delivering black, brown, indigenous, queer, female, and all intersectional subjectivities, if only apart from the tight grip of white supremacy. So here I am, here we are in August of 2020, as a colleague of mine, a professor of sociology at UC Berkeley keeps reminding me, the world is burning. What are you gonna do? So in times like these, if I can, I work. But what is that work? What is my work? While preparing for this colloquium, my friend and collaborator, Sarah Cargill, has suggested that perhaps new music was a strategy, or at least it could be, for realizing a future I have been too afraid or too unwilling to imagine. Maybe we could somehow decolonize and reframe the methods and narratives of modernism in which your white Eurocentric ideals and perspectives are embedded and repurpose them to realize the potential of infinite perspectives and ex expressivities, perhaps even my own. Can I repurpose and decolonize the formalist experiments of the 20th century? How much can I or must I distance myself from the substance, materials, and practices of new music in order to realize a different future for it and myself? Can the tools of white supremacy be used to dismantle white supremacy? I'm not sure, though part of my process is exploring the possibility. I think in this process, new music can be a vehicle in which we launch ourselves, composers of color, subalterns in a sea of white cis male hegemony, into a future where we don't even have to consider whiteness nor the institutions that uphold it. In this sense, new music becomes less about format or genre and instead becomes a way of working and living. In my work, I start with the basics. What do I like to do? 
I like hanging out with my friends. I like thinking big, stupid thoughts and working through those thoughts with these friends who also usually like thinking big, stupid thoughts. And we all like experimenting. In order to do this though, to interrogate what we're doing, why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, why it might be necessary or valuable, this process requires intense collaborations and thoughtful and expansive conversations integrated into the preparation and rehearsal process. The common practice of minimal rehearsal, guerrilla style reading sessions, these all serve a purpose, but not one of expanding new music into a realm beyond surfaces, commodification, tokenism, or systemic racism. I thrive in projects where the line between collaborator and friend, work and life, can be blurry, yet still hold space for individuality, where who we are and where, where we've come from are just as important as what we do, how well we can perform or compose. Each collaborator is a composer. Each composer is a performer. Everyone's subjectivity is part of the project in some way, and no one is anonymous. In these projects, collaborators can mean anyone who seeks a common creative goal from any, of, any or all backgrounds students, mentors, mentees, organizations, other artists, amateurs, professionals, technicians, family, in other words, a community. We speak a lot about the new music community and maybe pay more attention to what it is and less about who it, who it excludes. I've begun to consider more deeply an approach I've been calling an erotics of sound production as a guiding principle in these kinds of collaborations. The idea that music is the sum of many things, not simply sounds. Music is bodies and all their physiological glories and limitations, their background and training, their worldviews and upbringing, their traumas, their victories, their minds, what they love and what they hate. To tap into all of these things in the music making process is to reclaim an experimental practice from a culture that has more often than not divided and excluded. Because in this deeply collaborative process, rigor is, no, is not academic. It's a difficult exercise of self-examination and honest self-appraisal. And the reward is the catharsis of self-articulation and connection. I should add that more often than not, these projects don't enjoy the support of major institutions. A few days ago, Sarah, again, brilliant in her bluntness, asked the panel, what does artistic agency look like? Agency to me is daring to imagine a world where we do not think about whiteness, where it doesn't influence my day-to-day -day behavior, my life decisions, or even my artistic and creative ones. Where I don't need to rely on large institutional support to realize myself in my art practice. Where I don't need to chase purported prestige or wait for the gatekeepers to let me in. Where I can learn from my peers and collaborators and they from me where we support and trust and communicate often and honestly, where rigor and discipline are ex exercised with empathy and compassion. Of course, there's a lot to be said about institutional visibility and recognition, and such discussions are often tied to project funding. Institutional support can be and is crucial, but it isn't a signal of my worth. So right now, many of us are wondering, what does the future look like? I still cannot and will not project myself too far into that future. But I know if I continue with and within a community, advocating for a different way of working and living, I know it will arrive soon enough. Hello, everyone. Before I begin, I want to say thanks to Kurt and everyone at the 2020 Composers Conference for inviting me and listening to me. I've been talking quite a bit lately, and perhaps I'm repeating certain things, but if I do, trust me, these things are worth repeating. I also want to give a shout out to my fellow, fellow panelists. Thank you so much for your work, for your voice, and for your honesty. Your, your very being is an inspiration, so thank you. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my partner in crime, Ashley Gordon, Artistic Director of Castle of Our Skins. If you haven't heard of us and don't know what we do, please check us out at castleskins.org. 
I also want to give a shout out to my fellow Black composers, especially Black women composers who are continuing to create with dignity and excellence despite being so often overlooked. Many Black women composers and non-composers have had a major influence on the person I've become today, including my mom, of course. So I must always mention the power, wisdom, and nurturing energy of Black women. Lastly, I want to have a 30-second moment of silence for Breonna Taylor, Amaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Dominique Fells, Elijah McLean, Draylen Mason, Ayanna Stanley Jones, George Floyd, and all the Black and Brown people who have been and will be unjustly killed and murdered, mostly because of the very skin in which they were born. In the past months, I have frequently reflected on the differences between being Black and being white in the world of new music. What I'm about to say is by no means exhaustive, but just a small list of examples of some aspects of my career and the career of other Black composers that may differ from the analogous white experience. Point one, there have been multiple multiple moments where I've had internal questions about whether my CV and bio should contain language that makes it seem like I'm not Black, and whether or not I should put a picture of myself on my website. I've even contemplated reapplying to certain composition opportunities that rejected me, reapplying to them with the same piece, but under the identity of a white composer, just to see if my skin color may have influenced their decision. Full disclosure, I haven't done this, and I have no plans to do this, but I have thought about doing this. Point two. Some of my Black composer friends have confessed to me about moments in their careers where they question why they entered this overwhelmingly white field, and if their presence in this field is cultural betrayal. Obviously, such feelings occur because composers such as Vicente Lusitano, Ignatius Sancho, George Bridgetower, Jose Mauricio Nunes Garcia, Chevalier de Saint Georges, Blind Tom, Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, Estelle Ricketts, and too many more are hardly taught in academia, and their stories are hardly shared informally. Consequently, Bill Pock composers grow up thinking that their presence in this field is a deviation, when it certainly is not. Point three, throughout my career, I've also questioned the blackness of certain pieces I compose. When examining these works, I would ask myself if a certain piece was too black to submit to a certain opportunity, or if it wasn't black enough to speak to black audiences. While it's troubling to contemplate toning down one's blackness to be accepted by new music gatekeepers, it's actually just as troubling to constantly feel not black enough because what you love to do lies within an overwhelmingly white field. Point four, as I receive more commission requests, I find myself talking delicately around the details of the commission in order to know what exactly the commissioner wants. As a side point, I will admit that when I publicly embraced my social justice artist practice, I did so knowing full well that some people would consider me a one trick pony. So with that, when I get a commission now, there's usually this conversation about what the piece should be about. And I usually have a lengthy back and forth before I learn that the commissioner wants a politically critical piece or a new work relating to black culture or queer culture. This doesn't happen all the time, but the amount of times it does happen is unnerving. And I admittedly have this sigh of relief when someone commissions me to just compose a piece without giving me any guidelines other than duration and instrumentation. It's in these moments where I can control what piece I compose, whether it's social justice related or not. But this leads to my next and final point. 
while I don't con really consider myself to be a successful composer, I do think that I have an honest and healthy career. And I often wonder if I would be where I am right now if I didn't have a social justice practice and if I didn't speak out on various issues. What's more, it's painful to consider this. Who are the Bill Pock composers today who are successful, working, relatively famous and well-respected, who haven't said anything about their identity-based discrimination and oppressive experiences? And here's another question. If a Bill Bach creative wants to have a composition practice, must they compose pieces about their oppression and speak about their injustice to gain respect and success? When it comes to thinking about whiteness in Western classical music and new music, the very foundation of any line of inquiry and reasoning must be this. People who aren't white have been practitioners within this field for over 500 years. Throughout the entire history of this practice, there have been white actors who have deliberately tried to silence non-white practitioners, and the presence of such white actors has sadly not disappeared. The combination of such actors and the general white supremacist, patriarchal, Eurocentric, and classist unfolding of the world is responsible for this field being chock full of racism and otherism. Such injustice has endured for over 500 years. Think about that, over 500 years. So while I applaud performers, ensembles, and institutions who are pledging to program at least one work by a Black or Bill Pock composer on every concert for their upcoming season, do you really think that's enough? If every concert from now on till 500 years in the future contain only music by Bill Pock composers, that still wouldn't solve the problem especially if we continue to have specific expect expectations about the creative output of Bill Pock composers, and we continue the white European do no wrong exceptionalist mentality within this field. That said, I challenge any performer, ensemble, or institution to have an all black or Bill Pock composer season and not say a word about this programming choice and not highlight this decision but rather present their season to the world as an example of programming excellent music. What a radical thought, huh? Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah, pronouns she, her, they, them. I'm really happy to be here today and in the company of such brilliance and such resonant, clear, thoughtful articulations of experience and desire to see something different, to experience something different. There was a time in my life when I thought that new music was absolute bullshit. A curdling of cerebral fodder played it out by out of touch academics who spend their days building each other up on theories and concepts and insular bubbles with little to no relevance to my life, to my priorities, to my survival. Yet here I am today in this moment while we're navigating multiple global crises to participate in a generative conversation about an entire genre I once called a boring, overinflated intellectual circle jerk. At the time, I was too busy surviving to recognize, let alone consider, what new music could offer to someone like me. What could new music possibly do to support my survival and affirm the queerness, blackness, feminist, fluidity, ambiguity, and ancestral memory that form the very basis of my humanity. Critique and critical discourse, much like anger and rage, is a secondary response to hurt. It is a, a tricky 
and volatile tools we use to remind others that the world is bigger than what travels through any given individual's tiny immediate orbit. It is one of the many tools I employ to publicly defend my right to a vulnerable, nuanced, and layered existence. But critique, again, much like anger and rage when unchecked and used to reinforce systems of punitivity, have the potential to whittle us down to someone we no longer recognize. There is a point at which critique begins to mirror the tools of our colonizers, taking apart whole human beings to isolate them in glass encasing, prodding and preserving and compartmentalizing from a distance, forgetting that we too are in some way or another implicated in the perpetuation of the very violence we seek to end and transform. There are limits to this tool. And I think it's imperative at this time to remember that it is not the only tool we have access to. To paraphrase Black lesbian activist, poet, and my chosen ancestor, Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never be used to dismantle the master's house. So perhaps it is time to devise new tools of our own invention. Perhaps we can find what we need in the language of new music. This investigation is in large part the responsibility of the artist. Upon reflection, I recognize that my scathing critique of and what could only really be described as a disdain for new music was nothing more than a reasonable reaction to the palpable culture of self-perpetuating white brohood it currently upholds. This critique served as a righteous demonstration of self-protection and an articulation of self-regard. I said what I said, and there is nothing for me to take back. And as I mature in my own practice, I've come to understand that acknowledging the ways in which I've been deeply hurt, not just enraged, hurt by white supremacy and massage noir, is a critical step to facing my tender humanity and engaging in my own healing with depth so that I may create worlds that cast joyful, soft, complex versions of myself and my other queer, non-binary and trans, black, indigenous and POC siblings into visions of the future. In my everyday life, I find that the imagination of whiteness, when brought into focus through the lens of the white gaze, is dangerously narrow and limited. It is the narrow imagination of whiteness that morphs black, brown, and indigenous peoples into subaltern non-humans who deserve untimely, horrific, violent slaughter at the hands of the state and vigilante. The perception of who or what is threatening is shaped by the dominant imagination that is projected into the world through the white gaze, justifying the gratuitous mass murder of black, brown, and indigenous peoples today. It is a limited imagination of whiteness that allows white cishet men to be abstract and unintelligible without the risk of condescension, ostracization, admonishment, and other forms of social punishment from colleagues who claim to have better solutions for your garbled trash. I long for a world where being abstract in this body doesn't pose a threat to my life or my career. I long to experience being unabashedly unknowable, elusive, abstract, and unintelligible without disclaimers or apologies or formal explanations in the form of artist statements and quippy bite-sized tweets. I am not bite-sized and I am not here 
to satiate the voracious appetite of the white gaze. New music, I think, can be a vehicle for this journey in world making. Each collaboration, ideation, observation, and performance build a library of abstract language and collective memory that has the potential to write the score to our own becoming. Thank you. Thank you all for the opening statements. Um, the panel has agreed in a meeting earlier this week that the discussion will begin with and grow from a conversation about their work and even perhaps the work. So I'm gonna start off the conversation with Sarah. Um, I would like to just ask you, how do you approach your work as an artist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So first, I think it's really important to discuss how we're defining work uh, for a number of reasons. Partially because the roles that I play in my practice are pretty fluid and how I show up in my role really depends on the needs of the project and what it is that I wish to give and get out of that project. Um, but also, I think it's important to consider because not everything that I do that I, can, that I consider to be work is necessarily counted as work within the matrix of white supremacy and capitalism. So the kind of work that falls under the categories of work that's really hard but doesn't really count, um, <laughs> and therefore work that doesn't need to get paid for uh, are, it's basically emotional labor and relationship building. So because this type of labor is gendered and racialized, it's often undervalued and underpaid, uh, especially if that labor is coming from black women and femmes. Uh, I have to get real clear uh, with myself and set boundaries around the parameters of whatever project it is that I'm doing and to truly agree and consent to the labor that is being asked of me to get really clear about that. And within the structure of white supremacy, I often find that I'm being asked to perform lots of different kinds of labor uh, that is often unacknowledged and not paid for. So that's really for me. And um, yeah, a big part of my own journey within my career is figuring out um, what is a boundary? <laughs> how do I set it? And how does it help me be in authentic relationship with my, my colleagues? Because that's really what boundaries are. It's not about pushing people out, it's about teaching people how to interact with you in a way that is um, generative and not harmful. So once I'm able to define what the work actually is and what I will and won't do, I usually turn my attention towards inquiry to anchor projects in some kind of direction and purpose. So inquiry is basically like really clarifying and helps me to get at the root of what my actual interest is. And this inquiry also allows for me to think about any given project much more expansively, which is important for me because any project that I agree to participate in uh, should, for me, serve the purpose of drawing new connections or illuminating connections that are essentially hidden in plain sight. So when it comes to performance specifically though, because um, I, at the end of the day, I. I'm a musician and a flutist, and that's kind of the core of what I do. It's really important for me to prioritize relationship, consent, intimacy, and as Adrienne Marie Brown talks about in her book, Emergent Strategy, uh, moving at the speed of trust. So what that means for me and my practice is that I put a lot of energy and time into creating a container where it's safe and fun, um, where folks are encouraged to play and fail and start over and try on different ways of being in relationship with each other within the context of that performance. So in many ways, the exchange of inquiry rather than the exchange of like answers and directives really allows for this process to unfold at the speed of trust. Thank you. 
I wonder if we might even consider having there be a little bit of connection with what you just said, with what Amadeus said in his opening statement. I mean, you can we can have a little bit of a conversation about that of, of, around no one being anonymous inside of the community is about everyone being included. And I was wondering if maybe Amadeus, you could talk a little bit to that in relation to with Sarah. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, yeah, I just, um, just listening to Sarah speak, I mean, full disclosure to everyone watching, Sarah and I are, are close friends at this point and collaborators. So um, we share a lot of the same sort of ideas around what art making can be and perhaps in this moment should be um, and how that is, you know, I, I hinted at this earlier, how that is markedly different from how I was taught um, how I was, you know, you know, when I came to the Composers Conference, for instance, in 2011, it was at the suggestion of one of my advisors who had told me that these sort of things were something that I needed to do to, to have a career, um, whatever that means. I didn't even know what a, that you could have a career. I would hardly maybe even call what I have right now a career. It's, you know, it's a series of projects and people and collaborations and friends, you know, at this point. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess maybe it's how I was brought up too. It's just, I was always brought up in the community, you know, and, and all of a sudden I had to figure some stuff out in an aesthetic artistic silo, which felt really different for me, you know, playing in bands, being parts of large organizations, doing things collectively. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I had to make some adjustments and then more adjustments and then psychological adjustments. And then all of a sudden I forgot that I was brown and that I had come from a different place. And where I woke up to, the, 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 the place I was in artistically was not, some, was not a place that I thought was sort of honestly mine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had sort of regurgitated a lot of the things that had been shown and fed to me. And so in my statement, I, 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 was, I mentioned this process of decolonization that started maybe five or six years ago. So not even that recent or not even that long ago. Um, and in that I realized going back to my initial inclinations away from sort of the, um, you know, the product um, centered or the piece, the composition thing, the centered, um, you know, outcomes or whatever, and, and more towards the process, which, you know, I mean, new music has a history of that process of, of working out, you know, you know, we talk about, you know, I learned about Stockhausen and how he put the speakers on the, the thing and it spun around and all this stuff. You know, and you know, part of what I wa was going to say in my statement was I have all these examples of r radical innovation from you know Germans and French people, and you know, I, I learned about like the, the insane like social modernist music experiments of Jose Maceda, like four years ago, and there's and he's maybe the only example I have of another Filipino composer with any sort of recognition beyond you know, um, Filipinos ourselves, themselves, you know. So, you know, I mean, I don't even remember the question. What was the question? <laughs> hey, y'all should just, just hop, hop in here, you know? No, I'm I sorry, mean, sorry. I, I think that people should freely, should, should yeah. freely just, 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 just participate. There's, there's no reason for anything being formal here. Yeah, I mean, um, just like, just like just going back to the idea that that new music can be a strategy right you know something sarah said when we were preparing for this colloquium and i think that's useful because it's it's not if it is a strategy then it's something that we can all use and that everyone can use and it's not just for people who already have power or have sort of embedded in, in, in institutions so right i love the idea that or I'm sort of saddened first by the idea that perhaps the reality is, is that community as a strategy has really, is not a priority. 
um, it's maybe not even a consideration a lot of the times in new music. Um, it's just, it's not part of the paradigm. And this beautiful phrase, moving at the speed of trust, is something that I think can really uh, allow one to imagine a type of creative community um, activity and coming together that maybe new music has not, especially new music as it is facing, the public facing new music that, that the world sees does not actually see. I mean, it, just, we, it doesn't exist in the public facing new music. Um, that type of community um, based work that where we understand that all those who are involved are operating at, at such a high level of trust. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. Um, <laughs> please, others, come. Yeah. Well, like that rugged individualism is such a product of white supremacy, you know? Right. And so when, when I, for example, when I like step into orchestral spaces, there is no effort put towards um, building relationship with people. I've spent years getting to know the back of a bunch of people's heads really, really well, but like not knowing their names. And that's, that's alarming. <laughs> to know that you're sharing such an intimate experience with a, co a collective group of people, uh, the experience of not just creating new music together, but, you know, you're on a somatic and physiological level, you're literally adjusting your breath to the, the, the pace of other people's. And there's something that's incredibly connected and intimate and precious about that. And so when we don't take the time to actually build relationship together, I, al I often wonder how does that impact the level and depth at which we're able to um, perform the music itself? If we're not in right relationship with each other, how can we expect for you know, right relationship to come through the work itself when we don't lay the foundation for that? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um... There's so much to say about the idea of community within new music because I feel like there are many people within our field who are attempting to create various communities and some succeeding uh, in ways that we just can't see and perhaps in ways we're not meant to see. And I think that's that's a good thing to be honest. Um, but in terms of the new music, community as a whole, I'm thinking of, well, firstly, in the United States, there's, of course, New Music Gathering. And the idea behind that meeting is very much so rooted in the idea of community. And when we zoom out of that idea and we look at just practical things about what's going in the world fiscally, socially, um, psychologically as well. There is just lots of infighting within our field. And some of that, of course, has to do with money and opportunity. You know, you can make a joke that there are a hundred million composers in the world and five jobs, right? So people have to find some way to pay the rent and, and eat and, Etc. Um, and so that creates, I think, within certain groups, a level of mistrust, a level of dishonesty. Um, I, I know that I've had some ideas of mine, like, basically taken without getting credit. Um, I've shared opportunities with people thanklessly, you know, and I'm tr I try constantly to uplift everybody, um, as many people as I can. Uh, and in the past, it's usually just been something that I did just organically and hardly ever received, been on the receiving end of that. Um, fortunately, that's changing in my life a lot right now, um, but I always wondered where that came from, like why, maybe it was just my own perception, but why was I the only one sending out tips and tricks and not really getting anything? 
And I'm not sure if that's been any of your experiences. Yeah. I want to give um, others, I feel, I realize that I've been speaking a lot, so I want to make space after this, but that's literally, the answer is white supremacy. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that's kind of the, the running joke slash ongoing uh, answer is white supremacy. White supremacy and capitalism are close bedfellows, you know, and, and so that, that scarcity model, creating manufacturing scarcity, is such a, uh, a reflection of how white supremacy operates within our respective careers. It's absurd to me that we have institutions that are pumping out incredibly talented, incredibly trained um, musicians. And when they leave school, there are what, like maybe two slots available in some State that you may or may not want to move to, um, you know, and just it, it's absurd to me for like 300 flutists to be, you know, competing for one fucking slot. It doesn't make any sense when there are so many other ways to use this tool, this, this musicking, music making tool in so many other ways other than you know, going on an orchestra track, which is like, great. If that's what you want to do, cool. If you have the funds to, you know, do all of that, then great. But that's not always an option. And it certainly wasn't for me. And so I feel like what's so lovely about new music and um, chamber music too, within the context of new music, is that it helps to kind of lift the, the veil around this idea that opportunities only exist from this one source in a unidirectional way and that we have zero agency to create these opportunities for ourselves and make meaning of our, our work. That is so beautiful. I'm really glad you said that. You know, we all have these stories about orchestral auditions. <laughs> one of my friends who's a harpist found out about a really prestigious audition about 15 years ago. And she said, oh, no, I'm not going to apply, even though I, I have the chops, but I know who that job is going to. And it's just ridiculous. And of course, she was right. I mean, the person that she thought was going to get the job indeed get got that job. And I'm not going to name the organization, but I'm pretty sure many organizations are guilty of doing stuff like this. And where, what is the solution to this? I know part of it, of course, is encouraging the next generation of music students to think outside of the box and learn how to develop the tools to create your own opportunities. I've been trying to impart this idea with some of my friends and colleagues. Um, Ash and I at Castle of Our Skins have basically done that in a really roundabout way. Um, but that's what Castle of Our Skins really was. It was me and Ash recognizing a big problem, not only within the new music community, but within the greater classical music world and our own deficits. I mean, at, in 2013, when we founded the, the organization, we couldn't name more than 10 Black composers between the two of us. And that reminds me a little of what you were saying, Amadeus, about Filipino composers. Um, it, and, it, and it's sad because there are quite a number of really talented Filipino composers. And I remember one of my Filipino friends was asking me about some Filipino composers. And I just said, well, was, is Alan Hilario Filipino? I think he is. And he's a really amazing composer. And I've only seen his name once in a very obscure journal. And I've never come across his name in a classroom context in academia. And I don't think I've ever uh, discussed his music with my friends, uh, especially the ones who are just very entrenched in the new music world and know all of the names, Hoi Farts and, and Michel van der Ah and all of the names, but they don't know the Filipino names and the black names. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, um, I realized we were talking about, I realized you brought up the, the word solutions and I know in our, in previous conversations, really, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a it's a difficult thing to to consider. But um, and I wanted to bring Shalini into the conversation this way because I remember in our conversations we talked about education, and I know for me, one of the strategies or solutions that I sort of came around to was you know, what little I had, like you were saying, like you were all saying, what little I had, I, I tend to share. And that includes sort of mentorship time, sort of advocacy for the students, the sort of the next generation. Um, and that's not just knowledge, that's like physically, you know, giving a student a ride to a gig so that, and then helping them set up production for a project, showing them how to relate to venues, very just practical things that I had to learn on my own too, because I didn't have institutional support to like learn these things, you know? So um, so that's sort of practical education, but I mean, I know Shalini, you're, you're I, I'm not an, I guess I don't, I guess I would consider myself an educator, but like um, more like kind of like just by default almost, cause no one's gonna sh show, show these students or these, these younger people how to do things if I don't help them and then they're on their own, you know, I don't know. But um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, you know, I, it's interesting because I've never considered myself an educator either. And I, cause I never, again, I never kind of took the traditional path. And I, even though I did the whole, I, I stayed in the conservatory track and like, you know, it's so interesting to hear, you know, talking about orchestral auditions cause I was on that track for a little while before I realized it was just stifling me as an artist completely. Um, but, you know, my contact through with students in my day-to-day -day life it's not about teaching the violin because that's not something that really inspires me because I feel like it's just too constricted in the pedagogy and in the, what you're the supposed to do. And, you know, and I, I just don't find a lot of inspiration personally, but I have worked with a lot of young composers and I've had a lot of the composers that I know, you know, I tell them, you know, can, if you have a, a student who wants to know how to write a violin part or if they need help in some other way, if they need to know about groups that they should be sending their, their work to or anything like that, I try to encourage those types of relationships. And I try to reach out through um, the educators that I do know and also just at performances too. You know, I try to reach out as much as I can to the young people that are present. I try to make myself available as much as possible as a resource. And, and do the things, exactly the things that you're describing, you know, like suggest uh, pieces to work on, suggest, um, you know, someone to go talk to about your instrument if you need help with it, you know, and if you don't have the means to necessarily go to that best shop in town or whatever, you know, cause not all of us do. And, um, but, you know, I think also something that you brought up Amadeus in our conversation was um, sort of the inherent bias that there is in a lot of the stepping stones in the levels of education and like sort of what's expected of you to show of your work when you, in order to graduate to the next level, in order to be seen, in order to enter a competition or be considered for a position or a fellowship. And one of the things I'm trying to work on it with Brightwork, with the group that I just joined is we're trying to put together an initi initiative for young composers um, where they don't have to have that sort of training already. They don't have to come in knowing necessarily even Western notation or, um, or any kind of have your computer program that you know how to spit out parts on, you know, anything like that. You can come in from whatever idiom you're the most comfortable in, whatever genre is most inspiring to you and just get the chance to work with instrumentalists. And um, I feel like we need that kind of broadening in our education because I think what I've been feeling and I kind of tried to touch on in my statement is, is that I just feel, I've felt at so many stages in my, in my life in music, so constricted by what the institutions around us are expecting of us. And I think as the child of immigrants, I was given, um, you know, I was told to toe the line. I was told to, you know, stay the course, do your best, don't make waves. And I did that for a long time. And it has only been in my years as more of an adult and with my gray hair now that I can really say, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to toe that line. I don't want to, I don't want to be the model minority. You know, I need to reject that. And I feel like that is something that for a lot of our Asian community, 
that is something that we need to own. And in order to be real allies, we need to really come to terms with that history. And that is a history that was placed on us too. It's not a history that we created for ourselves. Um, but you know, I think this goes back also to community and what you guys have been talking about with like, which I think is so beautiful talking about community because instantaneously for me, the idea of the new music community brings to mind what I see on a brochure, you know, what the LA Phil sends out every year with the same faces on it every year and the same names. And I, I feel like there are certain people who think that there is a new music community that they're a part of, that is a very small bubble that they don't even, they don't even know how many people that they're excluding from that and from that conversation. And I think what I love about today is our chance here to create this community. And, and um, yeah, and I think, uh, I wish that as a, I, I wish that I was more involved with actual violin teaching in, in a way to kind of create that conversation within my instrument. But I feel like for me, my work has always been with young composers and um, to be an ally to them and to help them in any way I can. Um, yeah, that's great. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, going back to Sarah's initial, um, oh man, fire, fire, Sarah. The, it's like the, 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 the talk about critique, I think, especially in the university, you know, I, you know, I teach at, at UC Berkeley and, you know, it, it has a, a history, but, you know, I, I think in, in recent years, it's lost sight of that history. Um, but, you know, at a university, we, we, we talk a big talk about critique. Um, and yet I don't, I don't hear or see a lot of, um, I'm be careful here. Um, <laughs> you know, going back to Shalini's thing about not taking up space. I, you know, I, I've been learning to, 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 to allow myself to say more and to be more. It's still hard and it's, it's kind of, it's unlearning trauma. So, um, but you know, that being said, I, I don't see a lot of people being critical of what we're given, you know? Um, I had to discover that I, was, I wasn't satisfied with what I was given or taught because it didn't make me feel right, you know? So I had to trust my intuition instead of having someone or having someone teach me to be critical of what has been delivered to me in, in, in the academy. Um, so, you know, you know, not that I don't teach composition, you know, tuplets and pitch relationships and orchestration. Orchestration's tricky, um, uh, cause that's all colonialism. But, um, you know, but I do, I do try to teach a sense of integrity and honesty and living in the world in which all of these things exist. It's not just pitch relationships, it's pitch relationships between people and people live in a real world, you know? And, and I just don't hear a lot of that. I never got any of that, you know? I just got Schoenberg's String Trio, which is a great piece, but you know, doesn't teach you very much about going out in the world and doing stuff with your life. And you're all yeah. muted, so I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I hear you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I, yeah, I love this conversation. And just going back to this idea of like solutions too. Um, you know, I feel comfortable talking about this because, like, you know, it's for the most part like a group of folks of color. So I'm going to be speaking as if I am specifically referring, like, speaking to y'all. Um, white folks can listen, um, but I, I often get so frustrated when um, white folks and in institutions ask already underpaid, already underworked, you know, already like heavily burdened uh, folks of color within these institutions to do like extra work to figure out solutions to problems that they never created in the first place. And so when I hear white people say like, oh, like, what should I do? Like this racist stuff is happening. And, you know, my response is like, well, that's, that's actually not my problem. Racism is not my problem. I didn't make this shit up, y'all did. And I, as a black queer femme, don't actually have 
the institutional pull or power in order to enact the kind of changes that white people claim to want in their institutions. So it's always a conversation for me with my white colleagues or friends, um, you know, or the ones who are left anyway, uh, that it's, unless you can actually acknowledge the white supremacist that lives within you, nothing's gonna happen. Unless white people take this on as their burden, as their problem, and indeed white supremacy is a burden that not only impacts you know, folks of color and black folks, but it's also gravely dehumanizing for white people too. White people had to invent, you know, as James Baldwin says, or said, you know, white people had to invent the nigger in order to understand who they are. And what a, what a place to be in. What a, what a like, yeah. So my, my focus at this point, when it comes to, you know, looking into solutions, and for me, that means uh, being able to in my full agency without paying much mind to like the white gaze, you know, that's what success means to me. Uh, when I think about that, I just think about ways, the ways in which I can divest little by little from whiteness in other ways of being in worlds that, you know, white people don't have access to all the time. Yeah. And I just want to second what Shalini said about, you know, I recognize, you know, I, we all have uh, manifold identities and backgrounds and stuff. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I do have to recognize my privilege. You know, I do, like I said, I do teach at UC Berkeley. You know, I, I do, I am here at the Composers Conference, grateful for all the opportunities I've been given. You know, I, in the back of my head or not even very back there, but maybe towards more to the front, you know, there's, there's the sense that my proximity to white supremacy and whiteness and to people who have privilege and, you know, um, a kind of tokenism on, um, on their part of, of me, which has been verbalized, so it's not fake, it's not in my head, you know, um, you know has afforded me these opportunities. And as, as a, as a non-Black person of color, you know, it's, there is a lot that I need to, even though I'm brown, there's a lot that I need to take apart, obliterate, dismantle within myself and how I think and how I act and how I compose, how I make art. Um, and there's still a lot of that, you know, and that needs to be done. And that's part of this process, you know, the very real process of working with you, Sarah, is is has has done a uh, has done a lot to you know take that apart you know so um, and that's not work that I would have found you know you know at, when I lived in France you know for instance um, necessarily um, so I don't know I, it, um, or you know any other sort of like you know prestigious opportunity I've I've had so I mean these all the things that further the strategy that I was talking about have happened um, aside or apart from institutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, and to decolonize myself, I mean, that's gonna take a lifetime, you know, and, and that's a lot of hard work. It's a, you know, a lot of therapy bills. It's a lot of um, very tough conversations with my family, with my colleagues, you know, so I mean, but that's, you know, that's what, that's the work that I'm committed to. But I also think doing that work brings a lot of celebration and joy and, and discovery of worlds that we wouldn't otherwise discover when we don't do that work. So I think that's important to acknowledge just the way that Sarah acknowledged ancestors, you know, we have to continue to accept, acknowledge, and highlight the resilience, the resistance, the survival, the celebration of who we are and our past while we're doing this work. That's really the only way we can get through it. And 
And I just want more white folks to do that work. You know what I mean? They have Imagine. to. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, like it, it's that's, that's part of the work. And the thing is my work and our work as like folks of color, and I would even say more specifically the work of black folks versus the work of non-black people of color, um, are, that's gonna be different from the work that white folks need to do. And so that's why that question that I often get from white folks around like, specifically from white folks around finding solutions, it's like, my solution is actually very different from your solution. The things that I'm working on as a black queer femme is not falling into martyrdom every time some shit goes down and people look to me to like, you know, put out a bunch of fires for, no compensation. And so, you know, that's, that's a part of my work that is intensely internal and necessary and urgent. And it's not going to be, it's not going to look the same for other folks. Yeah. But that's also why I really appreciate what Shalini was saying about like, how teaching is not necessarily about teaching an instrument, it's about teaching something else that young folks can't access within the sphere of, you know, learning and the pedagogical frameworks that they're, you know, thrown into. And I think that that's really valuable to, to name that the work extends beyond teaching young folks where C is or, you know, what a modulation is, whatever. <laughs> I wonder if maybe we should take some questions and um, address some of the questions that we have. Are there questions? Yes. Oh, wow. I mean, I can't see the scroll. <laughs> it, it's on but YouTube, I can see the that's scroll why, yeah. And right. I'm glad um, that I can't actually. <laughs> I, can, I can see the scroll and I can, um, I'll just start if that's, if that's okay with you all. Um, and um, here's the first one. Do you find that your relationships to the institutional structures of the new music world versus the traditional classic music world are different? Of course they're intertwined, but curious about the nuances. Hmm. I mean, I can say that I've had a pretty equal experience with both. Um, I, I would say they are different and the same in a lot of ways. You know, I think that um, there is just a default to the the white male voice in the world in the room more often than not in most situations. And um, I feel that uh, in many of those situations, and more so in the traditional classical world, being a strong female presence is seen as being aggressive is seen as being somehow negative or critical and something um, inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think there's maybe a little bit more space for that in the new music world, because maybe there's a little bit more room for expression. But I, I honestly feel like there's just, for me, my personal experience has been that they're, they're quite similar. I would um, definitely agree and my experience has also not necessarily been a battle between the new music world and the classical institutional world, but more so a difference between conservative organizations and liberal organizations within both. And when I enter into these projects or collaborative experiences, you can almost immediately tell when one organization is more conservative than other organizations that you've worked with. In the less conservative organizations, there is this drive towards community, what we've been talking about, is drive towards openness and collaboration and making sure everyone's voices are heard and respected. And in the more conservative institutions, there's usually just a focus on getting something done and very, very quickly because time is money and money is energy and we can't waste people's energy and time because that's a waste of money. So we have to do things this way in very, very strict uh, checking, rule checking manners. And that honestly is really exhausting. And 
it yields a very specific type of product. And for many, that product is a goal. But I think for many of my colleagues and friends, we recognize that product as really being bullshit. So it's great to know that there is a world out there who has the bullshit meter high when it comes to recognizing which organizations put out that type of product versus the organizations that are open or even striving to be more open. And that's also really important to recognize, especially now. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback off of both of those things, I think the, the thing to, rem to remember is that organizations are, you know, even if they're nonprofit organizations have a bottom line, have a sort of economic side to them. And so you find with large organizations, whether it's, you know, a chamber orchestra or an orchestra orchestra, um, they're gonna be less flexible in a lot of ways. And that flexibility extends to many things in, in the organization. Um, you know, I, again, without saying too much, you know, I, I gotta pay the rent. I don't wanna piss off too many people, but you know, it's um, the larger the organization the, as to, you know, what Anthony was saying, you know, there is a degree of efficiency that needs to happen. And oftentimes that efficiency looks like optics, diversity optics rather than actual inclusion. Um, and so, yeah. And so it's, you know, I mean, it's the, I think, I think that's the main, um, that's the main difference I've seen between um, new music world where the organizations tend to be smaller. They tend to be a bit more ragtag, um, unless they're, you know, more like storied or historic institutions. But, um, but um, yeah, the main, the main difference I think is sort of size, I guess, for me, in my experience. Hmm. Thanks y'all. Yeah, I, I hear that. And I would also err on the side of no, it's the, it's the same. <laughs> um, and, I think the, the thing that really links these two um, not so separate communities together is this impulse to virtue signal um, with these like special type of programmings or whatever and the continued like pigeonholing of like, you know, artists like us. Uh, good old fashioned racism and like racism light are kind of like one and the same for me. Um, it's all white supremacy. And yeah, so for the most part, yeah, I, I, I think the part that I have a lot of frustration around is really the virtue signaling. Um, diversification without rectification, so rectifying the harm that was done, uh, repairing the harm that was done, you know, to whoever kicked off your diversity initiative, you know, like there is no real um, repair that's being invested into, again, falling back on relationships. And so my experience, both in, you know, the music world and also a bunch of other nonprofits, I have a background in education. So moving through like school districts and things like that, the, the thing that I keep running into over and over again is people want to diversify, but they don't actually want to address the problem that led to the harm being done onto that person of color in the first place. So it creates a situation where people of color are entering these jobs or positions or fellowships or whatever, um, thinking that an institution is going to do right by them and do better because like some bullshit went down, but that's not actually the case. They end up re-experiencing the same harm over and over again. And so, my, my challenge for folks is to really think about the ways in which um, you might try to find ways to absolve yourself uh, from being implicated in these systems. Uh, it's, yeah, you're not, you're not absolved just because you created some kind of diversity measure or just because you decided to work with a black person that one time or for, you know, February or whatever the hell. And, 
yeah, really take a look at the ways in which your investment in white supremacy on overt and really subtle covert levels, um, how that shapes your interactions with people and address that. Thank you. Yes. Speak about lifelong work. I mean, for real. I mean, that is a life project. Um, is it okay if I move on to another question? Great. Um, here's one. I was struck by Anthony's talk of whether some of his music is too black or not black enough. I often have similar feelings and questions, although regarding my Hispanic Latino heritage. How or what do you think can be done to better allow people to honestly express themselves both in strongly and explicitly expressing their cultural heritage, but also in expressing things that don't align with this? And I ought and I find and I find are often pushed aside in favor of a kind of tokenism where Bill Park are expected to always talk about BIPOC issues and cannot express themselves outside these realms? That's a great question. And I think this goes back to the general discussion we've been having about agency. Unfortunately, agency is associated with age and experience. And that's not true all the time, but that's been my life experience. I remember being younger and just thinking, yeah, I can't do certain things because I'm too young. And if I speak up now, then I'm going to be that person. And mm -hmm. those people are going to talk about me and badmouth me to everybody else. And I'm not going to be employed. I'm not going to get that next gig. And that's a fear. This is a real fear. And this fear still exists. It's still being perpetuated within the new music community, within performers, you know, there are students who are, for instance, abused by their teachers, by their studio teachers, and they fear speaking out about it because they might lose their uh, student status, or they might get kicked out of their schools, or they just might be bad mouth and they might not be able to get a job when they graduate, right? Part of hashtag me too was to address certain problems like this. And it's really painful to see some of the, the musicians who have been outed for their abuse still continue to be working, right? And this is just disgusting, it's deplorable. But the answer to this question is to have faith that one day you'll be able to create what you wanna create in spite of the negativity that you'll receive and in spite of the backlash the only way that we can say what we need to say and do what we need to do is by saying what we need to say and by doing what we need to do. Audrey Lord has been brought up in this conversation. She said something to the effect of when we're silent, we're silent because we're afraid that if we speak up, we'll be oppressed. But when we speak up, we're oppressed anyway. So it's better to speak, right? And this for me is one of the best quotes from Audre Lorde because she's just saying, "Silent, your silence isn't gonna protect you. So just create, continue to create and do what you need to do from your heart and be genuine about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I similar to what Anthony spoke about earlier and what he just said, I mean, I mean, I, I found this more happened more in my time in Europe and stuff. It's just like, how Filipino do I need to be? You know, how, you know, this idea of identity was, was, is very, um, uh, was very explicit in conversations. Um, and, you know, as I said in my, um, in my statement, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 35 now. I, de depending on who you are, that might be old or might be young, but, for me, I've, it's, I've gotten finally at 35 to the point where, yeah, I don't care. You know, I'm going to write, I'm gonna create the most honest thing I can that I want to do, what my desire tells me, what my craft can allow me. And, you know, I, 
I don't know what happens, you know, but for the all of my 20s up until this point, you know, in my teens, I did what I thought I needed to do to protect myself and to not take, again, take up too much space. You know, I was taught to not take up too much space. And so in my music, you know, it was, it was suggested to me at one point that the reason why my music is so intense, is so loud, is so cacophonous, is so bizarre, you know, um, is because that was me trying to articulate myself um, when, I, when I felt like I wasn't able to do it with my own voice or my own body. So I had to do it in my music. And so that has stayed with me, that sort of suggestion. And, you know, it has proven to be true. And now that I don't care so much and I am talking, I mean, the music's still loud and still, you know, it's still intense or whatever, but, um, but you know, I use my voice now to help other people, you know? Um, so, I mean, in, in that, I guess the answer is yes, have faith and yes, do, and do what you want. <laughs> I don't know. I, I give the worst advice. Don't listen to me. I would like to disagree with that respectfully, Amadeus. <laughs> no, you give great advice. Um, I feel like, yeah, this question comes up a lot for me, especially when I'm like applying for grants. Um, and I know that the institution um, is looking for something that's like black as hell, you know, and one must call into question what uh, what the dominant idea of black as hell actually looks like. Again, remembering that we're operating within the matrix that projects the white gaze into our reality, right? Remembering that. And so for me, I've just come to the conclusion that whatever it is that I do is black art because I'm doing it and I'm making it, you know, whatever I do is queer art because I'm doing it. But I think beyond that, I think it's really important to remember, but, uh, well, it's important for me to remember anyway, I'll just speak in I terms, that I have expertise beyond my identity. Of course, I'm an expert in my own identity and how I walk through this world, of course. Of course, everything that I do is going to be shaped by my experiences and how I relate to those experiences. But I think, I think more than that, it's critical to just remember that you get to be explorative and curious about things outside of diversity and inclusion, because your existence in and of itself is a form of resistance. And I would also say that resistance is not the reason why, you know, folks of color are here. I'm not meant to live a life full of resistance. I want to live a life that also includes joy, that also includes rest, that also includes um, curiosity and exploration that, um, that move in different spaces other than what white people want me to talk about. Um, and I recognize that that's not always the case. Sometimes we really do wanna uh, talk about and articulate our identities within our work. And that's really important to, to know how to do. And I think it's also important to build the, the other muscle of you know, doing work that is of interest to you um, and trusting that your identity and the things that are important to you uh, will come through in the work in and of itself. And if white people don't see that as like POC enough, that's again, their problem. Yeah, I, I think what, what all of you have said has been, is so right, right on the money. And, um, you know, I kind of want to ask a question too, with regards to this topic that, um, for like Anthony, you were talking about like the fear for students, you know, if, if you're in that position where you're kind of, you know, you're within an institution and you're working within an institution as a composition student, you know, and I ask this to all of you, um, and you feel like you're being guided by someone. And I feel like we've all heard these stories where the person who's supposed to be your mentor, the person who's supposed to be teaching you and guiding you is the one saying to you, well, you need to be more 
you need to be more this, you need to be more that if you want to get this grant or if you want to do this, or you're going to get more play if you can play up this side of your racial heritage. You know how, and this, I, I hope you guys can all, you know, chime in on this. How can that person, how can that student defend themselves in that situation? How can they, how can they, within that, that power structure that's always so set up, because we all, we all know that you can't necessarily go about that person's head because that person may have the same reaction. You can't necessarily um, go to student services because they're not gonna do anything for you, you know? And so what, what are the options that these students have if they're put in that position by a person of power? I just wanna say that I, I am still that person. You know, I mean, the thing is with academia, and you know any sort of profession or career is that um, you know you still need people to like write for you. You still need to have these connections. And so I am still, you know, at this stage of my career, like the suggestion to play up certain parts of who I am mm -hmm. um, is still made constantly. So I, I don't have a good answer to that only because I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing with that, you know. Um, all I can say is that for me and my students, because I am now gratefully in the position where I am writing letters of recommendations, and I'm really proud when my students get into grad school. I didn't know that it felt this good, you know. And so, um, you know, and they ask me about certain parts of their identity. and. It's a complicated, it's a complicated thing, you know, but just like this colloquium, my impulse is often to say, put your work first. Um, and like Sarah just said, you know, trust that your identity comes through that in some way and is in, and informs that work. But I'm open to, I'm out, very open to hearing what you all have to say because I need help too. <laughs> Well, I would say that um, these types of issues are so personal um, and dependent on what institution you're at, who you're studying with, et cetera, um, because somebody, for instance, experiencing these problems in New York or Chicago or LA, I think would have a completely different solution than the person who's studying uh, who's in these situations in like, Tampa or Denver or, you know, it, 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 there are regional subtleties and social mores and, and whatnot to be cognizant of continuously. Um, but for the most part, um, I would say the best thing to do, no matter where you are, is to find someone that you can trust. And that person can be older, can be younger, can be a colleague, can be somebody not within the new music or classical music institution, but someone who you can tell these experiences to just to get out whatever happened and someone who can work through something temporary, something immediate, and then hopefully through that working out, something more long-term can happen and, and a more viable solution can arise. But yeah, unfortunately, there's, there's no universal answer for this question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to... <sighs> chime in on this one too. And I think it, you know, as everyone has said in some way or another, it's, it really depends on your specific situation. Um, but I, I'm always suspicious of um, when people present like either or kind of solutions, either you do this or you do that. And I'm really a believer that there are, there is a third option. Um, and so for me, the third option has looked like knowing that when I write about my identity and use that as a way to, you know, craft a grant or anything like that or an application, what, what have you, it is just a tool. 
it's just a tool. It's not the entirety of who I am or what I'm about. And if that tool helps to get me the resources that I need so I can do whatever the hell I want to do, then great. You know, and then I think the, the other thing around um, just the power dynamic, like that's so real. That's so real. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people, including myself, like I'm a grad school dropout. Um, it's like, by, <laughs> it was, it's, you know, you, you have to, or at least I had to in that moment really decide what's more urgent for me. And at that time when I left grad school, my survival was the most urgent thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important to be grounded in your own boundaries around, you know, what you will and won't share, what kind of intimacy you will and won't share with people um, by way of, you know, talking about your, your identity, something as like personal and sacred as that. Thank you. Um, let's do one more question before we wrap up, if that's okay. Um, the next comment and question is, this is so beautiful and fascinating. How, how, how possible do you think it is to give your students critique without imposing your own values or perhaps learned values onto your students? I feel like that's impossible. <laughs> um, I, I guess, you know, different educators have different approaches, but um, with me, the way that I like to interact with um, my students and mentees, it's just so important for me to be clear that everything that I'm saying comes from a specific positionality, a specific set of experiences, and what works for me may or may not work for them. I'm only here to offer ideas or to maybe support them in like thinking through different ideas or different solutions. Um, but yeah, there's no way to not have your values be infused in critique or in advice. Um, but what is important is allowing space for students to be able to question you, um, to be able to Choose, choose something else without fear of, you know, uh, retaliation, because I've definitely experienced retaliation from teachers whose advice I was like, whatever about. Um, so, yeah, and I think, like anyone, young folks respect that when they know that you're grounded in, like, your, your truth and reality and know that, like, there's no... That's another thing about white supremacy is that it gives you this idea that the objective truth is even possible. But I read this thing, I think it was like on Instagram or something that just said, <laughs> uh, objectivity is just subjectivity with no self-reflection. And I really believe that. Um, there's no way to remove yourself from your own context. The only way to you know, engage is through acknowledging that. Yeah, I definitely second that. I think students, at least the students who choose you as a teacher are choosing you because of your experience, right? And sometimes, of course, we have students assigned to us. And in that role, we have to be hyper aware of the needs of our students. I think one of the ways to sort of get around this is, especially I'm, I'm coming from the composition uh, world. So to talk to your students about clarity and communication. Um, I feel like, yes, I do have my unique life and my unique identity, but talking about clarity and communication with a, com with a student composer can transcend my experience in many situations, um, whether or not that's clarity of notation, clarity of intent, clarity of the way you set a text, et cetera, um, talking about respect, about meta impl implications, about proportionality and my own experiencing of this piece and how that my own experiencing of that piece can translate to other people's experiencing of it, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, right? It, these are the things that as a composition teacher, we can talk about without super imposing our own um, experience and do this or else 
you're not going to get a job -ness to our students. Um, as a performer, of course, you can go into historical um, interpretation. You can talk about um, line clarity, also communication, but how your students' background is contributing to an interpretation, etc. So there are many ways when you focus more about general clarity and general communication that I think we can transcend these things. Um, but as Sarah said, we have to have honest conversations about these things with our students and to say, you know what, I might be wrong when I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to say this anyway. And I've done that with my students all the time. So. <laughs> I think that's I think that's so key because I think that's what's been missing from so much of music education for for decades. And you know, I I know that growing up as a violinist, it was just there were no choices, there were no options. You know, there was no discussion. It was like this slide here, this fingering. This is how you play it. It needs to sound like this. And then you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the whole orchestra track of you know that portion of musical life and I mean that is even more rigid even more you know constricting in that way and um but I think what both of you are saying about the type of relationship between a, a teacher and student is is so crucial and I really hope that that is evolving you know over time because I think putting a student in a position uh, whether it be an instrumentalist or a composer or, or a vocalist where they feel like they have no choices is really not teaching them to be in any kind of independent thinker at all. It's not teaching them to be any kind of citizen, you know, an artist citizen, you know, it's not giving them that part of the training, which is so crucial for us, for all of us going forward, if there's going to be any kind of change. So I think, um, I feel like as a student, you should also be try to actualize what your choices are and what your rights are, you know, and that if you're in a, in a situation where you feel like something is being put upon you that to find out if you can have a different choice, if you can find someone else to work with. And I, I did that as a student when I felt like I was being, you know, treated badly. And, you know, in, and it, again, as you guys said, it depends on the institution and it depends on what your choices are, but, you know, I think it's always worth exploring. Yeah. Um, yeah, Anthony, you sort of, for me, sort of just nailed my own approach even. I just, I, I, a couple of things. One is I, when I teach, I know for myself is that I need to be, you know, humility sort of plays a huge role in, 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 in a student teacher relationship where I am the teacher. Um, you know, oftentimes there's this assumed or implied power dynamic where I can't learn anything from my student, which is never the case. Um, more often than not, I learn from my students that they show me, you know, case in point, you know, composers conference, I'm here as a faculty. I, you know, I see all these scores and I hear, I hear all these thoughts that composers are having and I'm learning so much, you know, oftentimes especially in quarantine, I'm like, siloed in these walls and, you know, it's an echo chamber of the same thoughts I've been having for the past four months to two years. So, um, you know, I often go into every um, student situation where I'm the teacher um, hoping that I'll learn something, you know, and so I, I tend to have a hands-off approach, you know, very, I ask a lot of questions, um, you know, so, you know, and I'm also upfront about my biases, you know, who my teachers were, where I went to school, what kind of things I think, you know, I front load a lot of that. Um, some people find it annoying, but I find it, it's helpful for me just to sort of like set, set some of the ground rules. And, and just like the process that I'm on that I talked about, this sort of decolonizing process, you know, you know, things change, you know, having options like Shalini was saying and what you both were saying, um, giving the student agency, you know, we've, we, we spoke a lot about agency for ours, for ourselves, but, you know, as, as, as educators, I think it's, it's just as important to, to, like Shalini says, step back and, you know, let our students, you know, take charge of their, 
education, which is, you know, interesting in, in a time when we're educating via Zoom, right? Um, how much do I, how much of my energy and my self do I need to put into this medium? And how much responsibility does the other party have to meet me there? Um, so, I mean, there are, there are strange lessons to be learned um, on Zoom, funny enough, you know, because those same lessons um, apply to the real world. Um, and one more thing, I think it's weird that, um, like, I'd say all of my teach 90% of my teachers have been sort of white middle-aged Euro kind of European folks. And I don't think they've ever given this conversation any thought whatsoever. You know, the fact that we're talking about it, have thought about it, have opinions about it that go beyond, this is what I was taught, so this is how I'm gonna teach you, um, is very, is, you know, just another sort of semi-invisible tentacle of white supremacy, you know, that's in, embedded in our, in, our, um, in our educational system. So just something I was thinking also. I think you just hit the nail on the lack of imagination that is, in, <laughs> that is at the foundation of white supremacy or one of the many <laughs> things at the foundation of white supremacy. Yeah. So I think this pretty much brings us to the end of our symposium. It's been beautiful and fascinating to quote one of our question givers. <laughs> um, I wanna thank you all most sincerely this is um, remarkable, um, remarkable. And so I'm extending my gratitude to all of you. Um, I would just like to say that this is the first event for the conference and we have an event each evening, sometimes two a day coming up. And if you would like to have further details about the events of the conference up through August 9th, you can check on our YouTube channel here or go to our website, which is composersconference.org. Thank you all again, and be well and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.